Welcome to episode 187 of the Grow Your Independent Consulting Business Podcast. This is Melissa Lieberman, and today I'm so excited to talk about this topic that impacts so many of us as independent consultants, and that is the scenario where you take on a non-ideal client. Primarily, we're going to talk today about how to avoid taking on a non-ideal client, so fewer of them get through your filter. And then we'll also talk at the end about what to do when this happens. Sometimes we take on non-ideal clients and get ourselves trapped. And I don't want that to happen to you. So that is today's topic. I wonder if you have, as I was thinking about you and the independent consultant community in general this morning, I was thinking about that scenario where you take on a client and sometimes we have these red flags as we are going through the process to land the client and scope out the engagement. And we have these red flags and we ignore them or talk ourselves out of them. And then we kind of get going with that client and we realize, oh, we were right. That red flag was not something we should have overlooked. And then we kind of feel trapped or stuck. And so that's why I want to help you today is to notice that indicator when you're in the process of selling consulting and what to do about it so that you don't take on those types of non-ideal clients, even when you need the cash flow. And we'll talk about what that means here in a minute. And then also the scenario is where maybe it isn't feel like a red flag type client, but you just end up agreeing to a lower rate than is what your floor would be set at or a lower rate than you want to be working at, or a lower rate than you know will help you to reach your goals. And you agree to this because perhaps your pipeline isn't as robust as it could be, or you don't see any other work on the horizon, and so you agree to this lower rate or lower pricing of some sort, and then you're feeling stuck and regretful. And so those are the scenarios where if you haven't hit these yet, I promise you, you will. And if you've already hit these and you're kicking yourself over this, I really want to help you today. Whichever of those are situations you're in, it's not a problem. This is part of being a business owner. And I really want to help you with the tools to manage through this process so that you can number one, avoid it, even most often avoid it, avoid it more than you have been in the past, for example, or avoid it if you've never experienced this yet. And then what to do when you do find yourself in this position, because like I said, it is, it can be a comment for independent consultants to experience this at least once or twice in a year or every few years. So that's what we're here today to talk through. Now let's dive into the agenda specifically. So first I'm going to share with you four tools that you can use to avoid taking on those non-ideal clients. So these are intentional processes you can put in place in your business so that you fewer of these non-ideal clients get through your filter. We've talked about qualification filters in the past on this podcast. You can go back to that episode. We'll put the link in the show notes. But today we really want to talk about these tools that can help you to take to avoid taking on the non-ideal clients that you regret. Whether it's non-ideal from just the client behavior perspective or non-ideal from the nature of the engagement or non-ideal from a pricing and fee perspective. I will share with you these four tools that you can use to avoid taking on those non-ideal clients. And then the last of the five tools that I will share with you is how to exit a non-ideal client engagement when those first four tools don't work, which, and sometimes they don't, and that happens. And so we want to make sure that you're able to exit in a really powerful way, a non-ideal client engagement in a way that doesn't harm your reputation or your relationship with that client, but at the same time helps you get move on with your business so that you can achieve your goals, financial goals, nature of work goals, fulfillment goals, and be able to spend the time that in the way you want to be spending it without having to just muscle through every day trying to work through this non-ideal client that you signed and the opportunity cost that comes with that. Okay, my friend. So those are the two agenda items for today. And then the third is we'll wrap up today's episode with advice on how very specific, tangible advice on how to put this episode into action. 
even if you don't have a non-ideal client on your roster right now, or you don't have a non-ideal client in your pipeline right now, it can be really powerful to put these tools into action now before you need them to help set yourself up for success. So that is what we're doing. Before I go into tool number one, let's talk through the companion resource that goes with today's episode. And that is my book, Grow Your Consulting Business, the 14-step roadmap to make your independent consulting goals a reality. I've told you before on this podcast, there's a free download on my website. You can go to consultingbusinessbook.com or even melissabook.com and you can download a the free copy. I've told you before on a previous episode that I was going to change that download to the first three chapters, and I still am planning to do that. I just haven't made it to that step on my to-do list yet. So if you haven't yet downloaded the book, I would suggest doing it now before I get to all the chapters and you get access to all the chapters in this way to download instead of just the first three. So That is the companion resource. There are specifically two chapters I wanted to point out to you. Number one, the first chapter is chapter number eight, which is your consulting business model. And the second one is chapter 16, which is your business owner mindset system. And so I wanted to point those two particular chapters out to you because they really dovetail with what we're going to be talking about here today in terms of avoiding those non-ideal clients and what to do when you do sign one. Okay, so let's start with tool number one. Tool number one to avoid non-ideal consulting clients is for you to get really specific about your floor. And by floor, what I mean is number one, what is your minimum pricing that you'll agree to? What is, if you're still working on hourly or daily rates, what is the minimum? And don't make up a number and then negotiate later. It's truly your floor. It's truly your floor. What is the floor? And when the client offers less than that, then you know that that is a flag, that that's not a a client that you would be willing to proceed forward with from a sales cycle perspective or from a proposal perspective. So getting really clear, write it down. What is your floor? Now, sometimes clients might want to negotiate with you and say, okay, I'll agree to some portion of your fee structure and then the rest I want to pay you in equity, for example. Know ahead of time what it is that you'll agree to. Will you agree to less compensation, for example, from a rate perspective if you get equity in return? And if so, what are the characteristics of that equity that you would agree to that would then make up the floor for you, that would clear the bar for you in terms of that compensation piece of it. So this is really important to know in advance and to trust yourself that if a client is coming in and negotiating below your floor, that that is something that is a non-starter for you. And having that in place in advance and the clarity in place in advance can help you to avoid the situation where you're trying to talk yourself into something. Stay tuned because in a couple of tools here, I will talk about the situation where you're feeling desperate or it's true that you need the cash flow and what to do about that. So stay tuned to that here in a moment. But this first tool is getting really clear about your floor. And those three components of your floor are number one, what the pricing floor is, what's a minimum amount you'll take to work with a given client, might be an effective rate, might be a hourly rate, might be a daily rate, might be just knowing what the minimum is for the amount of capacity you would be giving to that client. Write it down. The second are a little bit softer, client characteristics. Are there certain characteristics of a client? Perhaps it's the industry the client's in or some personality characteristic of the primary stakeholder, whatever that is, write down what are those non-negotiables? What might must you see in a client? There may be some of those. And also if you see certain things in a client, what are non-starters for you? Getting really clear, putting your CEO hat on and getting really clear for yourself about what those characteristics are that are non-starters for you. Similarly, with engagements, are there certain non-starters for an engagement that you know that you're not willing to accept? 
For example, I've had consultants that I've worked with in the past where if there is not a primary point of contact, like a project manager or program manager or someone in the organization that the consultant can coordinate with to get on people's calendars, to make sure that the right people are in the room, that that can really help shepherd resources internally, they won't take those engagements. For you, the floor might be different, but just really knowing what it is that is required for you to be successful in your engagements, both financially and also with the client characteristics and engagement characteristics so that you're really clear and then can look for those things as you're moving through your business development process. Okay, so that's tool number one, know your floor to avoid those non-ideal clients. That's pretty straightforward and simple really, right? Now let's start moving into some of the little bit more complicated tools here. Number two, the second tool is using your emotional state as a tool. So let me give you an example. Your emotions can be an important indicator for you. And a lot of times, especially when it comes to business, we disregard them or we dismiss them or we aren't even aware of them at all. But when your emotions are high, your logic can be low. That's a quote from Chris Voss from the book, Never Split the Difference. It's a great book on negotiation. Highly recommend it if you haven't read it yet. But when your emotions are high, it can be that your logic is low. So let me tell you what this means in the context of leveraging your emotional state as a tool to help you avoid non-ideal clients. Think about this, when you're in a scarcity mindset or when you're afraid that you're not going to sign any clients, when you're afraid that there isn't work on the horizon, when you're afraid that you're not going to have the cash flow that you need to live on or to support your business, or when you're afraid that you're not going to hit your business goals, think back to a time where you were in that emotional state. That is typically when we're in either fear or scarcity, that is typically when we make decisions in our business to take on client work that is non-ideal. That is where we're talking ourselves into something and then we get into it in a week or two, maybe even a day, a day or two or a week or two later, we start regretting it. We realize I should have listened to myself. I should have listened to myself and I knew better than this. I knew better than to take on this client. Have you ever been in that situation? So many of us have. I definitely have. I definitely have, especially earlier on when I was purely consulting and helping startups scale. That was my primary focus when I was consulting, doing strategy and management consulting. I would tell myself, some of these people that I was working with, I knew from my corporate experience, I knew better. I knew what it would be like to work with them. And I did it anyway usually out of scarcity and fear. And then I would get to that point in the conversation with myself a a few, a week or two into it and say, I knew better than this. What was I thinking? Well, I did it because I was afraid. I was afraid that there wouldn't be any other clients. I was afraid that I wouldn't hit my revenue goals or be able to contribute the amount of money that we had budgeted as a family. And so for you, really looking at your emotional state and knowing how you're making decisions and from what emotional state you're making those decisions. Is it from certainty and clarity or is it from scarcity and fear? Using your emotion as a tool, as an indicator for yourself can help you to avoid these non-ideal clients. And what does that look like? So what that can look like is as you're going through the process of selling new consulting work or even continuation work with an existing client, Let's say that you get to the place where you're negotiating a rate, for example, or the pricing, for example, and you realize that it's below your floor. You want to take a pause. Remember, when emotions are high, logic is low. You want to take a pause and say to yourself, okay, this is below my floor. Tool number one, this is below my floor. You know your floor, so we've got that in place. You say to yourself, this is below my floor. I notice myself being tempted to take it anyway, or to talk myself into this. Sometimes we talk ourselves into things like, this is a really important relationship. It'll be a way to invest in the relationship and get my foot in the door. You want to, at that juncture, ask yourself, 
what is my emotion right now? In what way could I be feeling fear? In what way could this be a scarcity mindset? And answer those questions. Answer those questions. Because for a lot of us, we don't have as much of a command on our emotions as is possible. We'll put it that way. And so sometimes it's hard to notice that we're in this scarcity mindset or set of fear in, that we're experiencing as an emotion. And so you want to take a moment and ask yourself, in what ways would agreeing to this fee below my floor be driven by fear? And answer that question for yourself. Or in what ways would me agreeing to this engagement that is below my floor, in what ways is that driven by scarcity? and answer that question for yourself. It can be as simple as leveraging your emotional state as a tool to pause and give yourself room to really explore and think about what's going on before you agree to something. Now, it might be that you're working on a proposal or you received an email from the potential client and you have that ability to take that pause because it's something that's more asynchronous. But you may also be in the situation in the real time where a client says to you, here's my best and final offer in terms of what we can afford or what the budget would look like. Give yourself that space. Tell them, you know what? That's a number that is below my typical floor. Is there any more wiggle room here? How could we structure this in a way that does work for both of us? And let's say you get to the point where you realize that at an impasse, they've got a certain number, you've got a certain number. Let them know, you know what, this is something as a business owner, I, I really need to take back and think about. And let's schedule another call for tomorrow to finalize this out. I know we really want to work together. You want to work with me. I really want to work with you and figure out a way to do this. But as a business owner, I need to take this back and figure out what this might mean to my business. Give yourself a pause. You don't have to answer right in the moment. Now, there is a potential the client may go away or whatever, but being okay with that is part of being a business owner. So that's the second tool for you is leveraging your emotional state as an indicator so that you can avoid taking those non-ideal clients because you typically take them out of fear or scarcity, and we don't want you to do that. We want you to make decisions that are really powerful for you in your business. Even if you are feeling like you need to make decisions out of a cash flow perspective, there are other ways to do that. And I'll share with you here in a moment what that might look like. Okay, now let's move on to tool number three. Tool number three. Again, we're talking here about those tools that you can use to avoid taking on non-ideal clients. We didn't talk about this so much, and I'm going to pause here for a moment, but why does it matter? Why does it matter to take on, we could just assume that this is important, right? But at the end of the day, when you take on non-ideal clients, there's an opportunity cost to that. Not only are you taking on non-ideal clients that perhaps are paying you less than your floor, and so therefore you're making less money than you're capable of making. There's also that emotional cost to those non-ideal clients because it takes so much more emotional effort to work through the regret that you might have of signing them in the first place and to know that you're doing all of this work for them and it's not for your typical compensation or it could be that you're paying the price from an emotional perspective and that emotional overhead of dealing with a client who is non-ideal from a behavioral perspective or the nature of work that you've agreed to. That all creates an a cost for you as a business owner, not only financially, but also when it comes to the emotional overhead that you've got to manage through. And it's really challenging being a business owner. And so when you're taking on these non-ideal clients, that cost can be really high and it can end up costing you more money, not just on the financial side, but on the side of you having that bandwidth to take on more ideal clients, you not having the capacity to take on more ideal clients, and you not having the emotional capacity to take on those more ideal clients, even if you have the 
physical capacity to do so. So that's why we're talking about this here today. Just kind of a little pause in our episode here to remind you why this is important. And so now let's move on to tool number three, which is intentionally building your confidence. This is such a helpful tool to avoid taking on those non-ideal clients because the more confident you are in your capabilities as a consultant and also as a business owner, the more confidence you're going to have to turn away this type of non-ideal work. It's really important to have this confidence ahead of time, even if your pipeline isn't as full as, as you want it to be, even if you are concerned about your cash flow. It's so when we talk about this tool, number three, intentionally building your confidence, proactively building your confidence, not relying on the results that you're creating or not creating to influence your confidence. This is incredibly important because if you think about it, the more confident you are, the more likely it is that you will adhere to those floors that you establish with that first tool. The more confident you are, even if you don't have a current client that you're working with right now, even if you're behind in your financial goals, even if your pipeline is weaker than you want it to be, the more confident you are in your ability to create results will then ultimately be the thing that creates those results for you. So one way I love to look at this that I wanted to share with you here today is as soon as thinking. Have you ever experienced this? As soon as I land another client, I'll feel confident. As soon as I have a few leads in my pipeline, I'll feel confident. As soon as I sign, engage a client at my new pricing, I'll feel confident. That as soon as thinking is one of the contributing factors to you going down the path of signing and engaging with non-ideal clients for you and your business. It's actually the reverse. It isn't as soon as anything. It's you generating and having a practice, an intentional practice of generating confidence ahead of time without the results yet or without the most recent results yet to create that confidence that then will result in you filling your pipeline will result in you filling your pipeline with higher quality clients, will result in you filling your pipeline with higher paying clients. It's incumbent upon you to go first. You create the confidence to create the results, not expect the results to create your confidence. So this tool number three that I'm sharing with you today with respect to avoiding non-ideal clients is for you to have a practice of building confidence ahead of time so that you feel so confident that you're able to create work and ideal work when you need it and when you want it, that you then set yourself up to turn away those non-ideal clients. You have to be in an emotional state and level of confidence so that you are able to turn away those non-ideal clients. That's how we avoid the non-ideal clients, by turning them away. Okay, now number four. Tool number four for you to avoid non-ideal clients is to develop alternatives you can lean on. This is what I was alluding to earlier. Sometimes you're in a pinch. Sometimes you are having a cash flow concern and you aren't yet at the place where you're able to bring on clients quickly, for example. Maybe you don't have a track record of landing clients having short sales cycles, for example. And so you know that you're in a scarce mindset. You know that you're operating off of fear, but you also are at a place where you feel like you have no other option, that you need to land a client. The first thing I would say to you is, and this is a bonus tool, we'll call it that, a bonus tool. The first thing I want to say to you is, before we lean on one of these alternatives I'm about to share with you, you want to get really clear about the truth of the situation. Because sometimes I hear clients telling me, consultants telling me, look, Melissa, I have to take this client. I don't have any other option from a cash flow perspective. Or look, Melissa, I've got a bird in the hand and this is the only way that I'm going to hit my revenue goals this year. 
And I say, okay, great. Let's just take a step back and look at the truth of the situation. Look at the math of the situation and just double check that what you're thinking is accurate. And I have to tell you probably eight times out of 10, the math that they don't know the math, number one, they're working off of just intuition. And number two, once we do actually look at the math, it's better than what they thought it was. So this is the bonus tool here is before we work on any alternatives of those situations where you are in a pinch and you do need the cash flow and what that might look like when you're talking to a non-ideal client, the bonus tool is get really clear about the math and triple check that what you're thinking is actually accurate because our mind plays tricks with us. And a lot of times it's not as bad as we think it is. Okay, so with that bonus tool, now let's talk about the situation when you're in a pinch, when you do need the cash flow, you've confirmed that that's true, and you're kind of in this place of, but Melissa, I know my floor, I know that I'm operating off of fear and scarcity, I know that I'm not quite, haven't yet generated the level of confidence ahead of time that would be ideal, what do I do? I have a bird in the hand. I have a client. What can I do? I know they're non ideal, but I do want to take them on because of the cash flow considerations. Now, what? With all of those things in mind, the tool number four that you can leverage is if you feel like you're in this spot, to not tie yourself up, to develop alternatives offerings that you can lean on. For example, Instead of agreeing to a longer term engagement where perhaps you're providing some kind of fractional work for them that's that really has no specific end date, or they're wanting you to sign on for a six or 12 month project, instead of that, go down the path of offering some form of a quick hit type project, like an assessment or a scoping, to like a phase one, a strategy type work, a deeper assessment type work a scoping or road mapping type work. Now, why this type of alternative can be really valuable is that number one, it's shorter term. So you might be agreeing to a fee structure that's below your floor, but it's shorter term, right? So you're not tying yourself up both from a capacity perspective and an emotional perspective for a longer period of time. It might be two weeks or three weeks or a month instead of six months or a year. So number one, you're giving yourself some Cash flow while at the same time giving yourself some flexibility to find an ideal client to replace them. The other thing that this does is oftentimes, once you get in there and behind the scenes with a client, you start to learn more. And then it helps you to offer something that is more of a win win for subsequent engagements. So let me give you an example. Let's say that this happened for a consultant that I was working with where they were talking with a client and knew that that client in many ways, both financially and also some of the characteristics of that client were not ideal, but they had this cash flow concern. And so they decided that in rather than offering the full engagement to that client, which in this case happened to be a software implementation, a replacement software implementation, they decided to offer a initial vendor selection type of an engagement. And they scoped that out in a more fixed fee way. So they were able to work around some of the rate scenario with that client, increase their effective rate a little bit as a result. This was a six week engagement. So they were able to really sh shorten the amount of commitment they were making to that client, give themselves some flexibility because if they decided they didn't want to continue on with the implementation, they gave themselves a lot of flexibility in terms of they could have stayed on in just a kind of a program management capacity. They could have brought in a, they knew they would be able to bring in another vendor to do the implementation or some kind of a hybrid type of a project where they were doing some of the implementation and had other contractors or subcontractors or firms doing another part of it. It just gave them a lot of options. So that's what they recommended to this client. Look, let's take this step by step. The first engagement that they proposed was a vendor selection. And from there, what they were able to do is really get in under the covers with that client, 
develop their relationship with that client, provide value to that client, help steer that client away from some really bad decisions so the client could see so much more of the value that they would bring to the table. And then from there, they got more clarity that this was not a non-ideal client from just the characteristics of the client. It was a non-ideal client from the pricing that that client wanted to pay from a rate perspective. But when they were ready to propose the second statement of work with that client, they had so many more internal data points, so much more buy-in and relationship with that client that then they were able to propose a project type of an arrangement that exceeded their floor. So that can be a really good way to approach these types of clients when they're wanting to negotiate off of a rate, you can set yourself up in a way that doesn't tie yourself up. Even if you agree to take that rate that's less than your floor, in this way, you are setting yourself up for options and flexibility where you may agree to that lower rate just from a cash flow perspective, but not continue on with that client after some kind of short term agreement or engagement that you agree with them. Or you set yourself up to have so many more data points that then it ends up creating a scenario where you're able to exceed your floor and they become an ideal client for you. And like the example I just gave. So that's tool number four, developing those alternatives to lean on. And then tool number five, if you want to call it that, is to avoid non-ideal clients, is to know that you might sign a non-ideal client either because you didn't realize up front or like the example we just described where you decide from a business perspective that you want to engage with this non-ideal client and kind of override your policies. The fifth tool is knowing that you can exit this type of non-ideal client, that you do have flexibility and power in this situation, and that you're not stuck once you make this decision, even if you've overridden those other policies that you put in place that we just talked about in the first four tools. Now, listen, this idea of exiting a non-ideal client could be its own episode in and of itself. But here's what I want to say to you is number one, when you think about avoiding non-ideal clients and you go down the path of kind of testing out a client that feels like it might not be ideal, you can know that you can exit that relationship at any point in time. So often I hear from consultants who stick out, gut out, muscle out non-ideal clients who are either lower paying or behaviorally non-ideal or both. And they don't want to exit that relationship because they don't want to impact their reputation. They don't want to let that client down. Think about this. So often I notice consultants staying in an engagement longer than they would give notice to a full-time job two or three weeks, right? We give a full-time job two or three weeks notice, but yet we stay with non-ideal clients for months and sometimes years at a time and don't give them notice. Think about the flip side of this for a second. How much notice does your client need to give you if they want to terminate the engagement? A lot of times it's no notice whatsoever. You're a consultant. They don't owe you anything unless there's something in the contract that requires some, some longer period of notice. They can fire you whenever they want to as a consultant. You have that option as a consultant as well. Now, I'm not saying to go out and fire this non-ideal client with no notice or anything like that. But what I do want to point out to you is that you do have more options than you might be giving yourself credit for, or that you might not be recognizing. You have options. And that can be really freeing when you think about dealing with these non-ideal clients and avoiding these non-ideal clients, even after you sign them. So know that you have these options. Now, what does that mean in practice? The first thing is just knowing, number one, that you have these options. And then number two, what I recommend is shifting the questions that you're asking yourself as a business owner to start to think about what your path forward would be when you're in this non-ideal client situation. The typical questions that I hear consultants asking themselves, and believe me, I've done this myself many times when I was consulting full-time, the typical questions we ask ourselves are things like, how can I make this work? Or how long can I last at doing this? 
or how can I make this less painful? Or asking yourself some form of how can I avoid damaging the relationship? Those are typically the types of questions we ask ourselves when we get into the situation of a non-ideal client. And I recommend to you as this fifth tool to shift those questions that you're asking yourself as a business owner. When you're ready to really start thinking about how do you exit a non-ideal client before the contract is over or before even the verbal commitment has been met. Ask yourself, what alternative solutions could I offer to this client? Could be you offering some different type of service than what you both thought that they wanted when you first signed the contract. Maybe you got into the situation, you're under the covers and you're realizing the solution that you're providing to them is really not what they need. Maybe you got yourself stuck into more of a staff augmentation type of a role and you want to say to them, listen, when we were first talking about this, this is what we both thought it might look like. And now I'm seeing that it's looking like this. And what I think you might actually benefit more from is something different and talking with them about that. Ask yourself as a business owner, what could make this a win-win, not a lose-win? What could make this a win-win for both of you? And then having the bravery and the confidence to go have those conversations with your ideal client. Sometimes we think, I better just gut this out for a period of time and then I'll almost earn the right to come back to them. Think about this in a slightly different way. In what way might you having an earlier conversation with them be beneficial to both of you? Spend time thinking through these things as a business owner instead of just deciding, well, I signed up for this, I better do it and I better figure out how to make it work and not entertaining both sides of this equation of how could I get the client what they need in maybe a different way, referring them to someone else that this would be ideal for, or shifting the nature of the work so that both of you are getting something more ideal out of this relationship. And being willing to explore that versus just putting your blinders on and going down the path of satisfying whatever you agreed to with this client that isn't serving both of you. So that is the fifth tool is really knowing how and having a plan and thinking through what a plan might be to exit a non-ideal client earlier than later so that the opportunity cost for you and the sunk cost for you is not something that is a long lasting impact to your business. All right, my friend, let's wrap up today's episode with the six ways you can put this episode into action. The first is to go download the book and look at those chapters I recommended, including your business model and your business mindset. I think it was eight and 16. I could be wrong, but I think those are the right two chapters. You can find that at consultingbusinessbook.com. The second is for you to go and define your floor for yourself. Do it when you're not in the peak of an emotional negotiation. Define your floor, your pricing, your client characteristics, your engagement characteristics. Step three, put a practice in place where you're noticing your emotional state and putting a backdrop in place for yourself or backstops. That was the word I was looking for. Put the backstops in place for yourself so that you notice that emotional state before you proceed forward with making any agreements and don't make agreements out of scarcity or fear. Step number four is developing a practice to proactively generate that confidence ahead of time. It's not the as soon as mindset, it's the creating the confidence ahead of time so that you don't find yourself negotiating with yourself and agreeing to take on these non-ideal clients. And then number five, tool number five is developing those quick hit type offerings. So when you do notice yourself in a pinch where once you have validated that you are needing the cash flow. That was the bonus tip, right? Use your math, go double check that don't go off of your feeling because a lot of times we think that we are more behind than where we are. Go double check that. And then if you have validated that you do need the cash flow, offer something that's a quicker hit so you're not tying yourself down to this non ideal client. And then number six is the tool of pivoting. As a CEO, you have options, even when you do engage a non-ideal client and asking yourself those powerful questions to figure out how to shift the nature of a relationship or change the nature of a relationship with a non-ideal client in a way that benefits both of you without just assuming you've got to power through whatever contract you signed with them. 
All right. That is what I have for you today. And I look forward to seeing you again next week. Take care. Thanks for joining me this week on the Grow Your Independent Consulting Business podcast. If you liked today's episode, I have three quick next steps for you. First, click subscribe on Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen to make sure you don't miss future episodes. Next, leave me a review in your podcast app so other independent consultants can find and benefit too. And finally, to put the ideas from today's episode into action, head over to melissalieberman.com for the show notes and more resources to help you grow your consulting practice from your first few projects into a full-fledged business. See you next week.